Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And as is the norm, we always have a packed agenda to discuss. Tonight is no different. I want to begin by welcoming our viewers who are joining us on television from region number five, West Coast Barbies. Welcome to another program of issues in the news. Across the Barbies River, region number six, along the east bank of the Barbies River, New Amsterdam, Kanji, and of course along the quarantine coast all the way to Siparuta. Welcome to another program of issues in the news. All of you who are joining us uh, on television from that beautiful region, region number six. To our viewers and listeners who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of issues in the news. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, right across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia. I see someone on, from Afghanistan watching us, uh, all the way to Australia, New Zealand. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. The viewership on this program is getting larger and larger and more and more distant places or persons from distant places places are joining us <clears throat> on this program. I'm a little under the weather, but I'm here, don't worry. I want to begin by recognizing the fact that our Hindu brothers and sisters are observing the auspicious occasion of Nauratri, and I want to extend Nauratri greetings to all of you, and indeed to non-Hindus as well, May Mother Durga's blessing reach all of you during this nine nights of devotion. My brothers and sisters, my Hindu brothers and sisters in particular, Nauratri greetings to all of you. I've been unable yet to go to the Mandir, but tomorrow I promise to be in the Mandirs on the east coast of Damarara. Well, the CPL is now finished. Guyana did exceptionally well to reach the finals. Unfortunately, we played exceptionally bad. And St. Lucia Kings, on the other hand, played exceptionally well. And they won. They were the better team. And they won the championship because they played better cricket. But more importantly, thousands of persons who look at this program from the diaspora, from different parts of the world, were in Guyana to watch the CPL games. And I had the opportunity, rather I had the privilege, and I was blessed to meet a number of you persons whose names I read on this screen, I read your comments, I read your, your praises, I read your criticism sometimes from all over the United States, all over Europe, all over Canada. Many, many of you were in Guyana for the cricket and I had the privilege of meeting with you. It was indeed a great experience to meet you. I don't want to begin calling names because I would not remember all the names, but many, many of you, you know yourselves, we met with a large crew out of Florida, a large crew out of New York, a large crew out of Toronto, and, and may, many other places. So thank you very much for looking at this program, keep looking at this program, and it was a great privilege to meet all of you, and hopefully I will continue to meet many more of you. Your names, as I said, I see them every day. 
I, I see them every week, and it's really, really a great experience to meet you in person. And it's also a great admiration. Um, I, I admire the fact that you look at this program so loyally, and you, some of you, I remember you telling me what I have said and quoting me back. <laughs> it was really flattering as well as, as I said, a blessing. So thank you very much, and also continue to share this program. Press the share button on your phone so that all your friends and your followers can join us in tonight's discussion. So again, please share the program so that all your friends and your followers, and as I always say, make use of the comment section. Put your questions there, put your views there, put your queries there so that we can make this program an interactive one and I can get an opportunity to um, interact with you and assist you, uh, if I can, with whatever it is that you would like me to answer or to speak on. And I, I am sure that you are also as tired as I am, having been to all the cricket matches and participating in the celebrations um, that accompany cricket in Guyana. We have another tournament, as you know, the Premier Global League, which will start um, at the end of November. So more cricket again, and more of you will come to Guyana. And I would really treasure and cherish the opportunity to meet more of you. So please keep coming. We will stay in touch. And hopefully I get to meet more and more of you in person. And I become familiar with the names that I'm seeing. Um, every time I host this program. Having said all of that, now let's get into business. Now, as you know, I have said repeatedly, I have spoken repeatedly about the coalition's government's negligence in many, many respects, which have left our government with huge liabilities, debts, and lawsuits to both defend and prosecute. And they have done so without any remorse and with impunity. So we know about the parking meter contract, and we know that we are spending millions of US dollars in a tribunal in Washington, D.C., to defend that ridiculous and horrendous parking meter deal that they went ahead to implement in Guyana and a contract that they executed against the advice of the opposition and against the public opinion of the people of the country because that is how they govern. They know everything and they are dictators, and you know that. They have also, as you know, they, they took thousands of ton, tons of rice from the millers and sold it on behalf of the millers to the Panamanian government and never collected a cent for those rights that they sold and delivered. This rice being the property of the millers, utilizing the Guyana Rice Marketing Board, they took the rice from the millers and they sold the rice to Panama. And rather than expend the energy and the effort to receive payment for that rice, they never did that and they left government, and the millers were left on their own. The value of the rice that they sold was 7.5 million US dollars, and the millers were out of pocket from those transactions to the tune of 7.5 million dollars. No appreciable or discernible efforts 
were made by the coalition government to receive payment of this sum. So the millers were left to bear the brunt, well not bear the brunt, but bear all the losses. Some of them have since ran into bankruptcy as a result of this debacle. When we got into government, we inherited this liability. And we then had to make efforts to get Panama to pay. Interventions were made at the highest level of the president himself with the president of Panama. That did not yield the type of success which we thought it would yield. The Ministry of Agriculture and the Guyana Rice Marketing Board retained lawyers and representatives in Panama to try to get the money. Those efforts were also futile. We were forced to retain lawyers in the U.S. again and to file proceedings at the International Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Center in Paris, France. And those proceedings combined with the government's efforts eventually led to a resolution of this matter. And the Panama government finally paid the full sum of 7.5 million US dollars plus our legal costs to the tune of about 100,000 US dollars. And the Rice Marketing Board received, the Guyana Rice Marketing Board received that sum of money. That sum of money, as I said, will now have to be paid over to the various rice millers whose rights the coalition government took and gave it to Panama. Because they didn't sell. When you sell, you get pay. They gave the people rights to the Panamanians and left it like that. And these are the very people that shamelessly lectures us and pontificates about good governance, about responsible governance. These very people. Cathy Hughes and the AFC were very much part of that government. In fact, Cathy Hughes held the portfolio of Minister of Trade and Cult Communication. That is what that was a trade transaction. And this is a woman who is leading, whose husband is leading a team, including her, telling you in America about good governance. And that if you support them, what and what they will do. And here it is, I'm giving you a real example of the neglect the incompetence and the sheer complacency of them while they were in government. You see, what they are good for is to make promises. Anyone can make promises. Promises are easy to make. It is the delivery of the promise. It is the track record of performance. So they can never speak. The APNU AFC can never speak. And they will never speak about the track record in government. They will continue to make promises. And a few gullible people are listening to the promises because they say attractive things. They said to this rice industry, they said to the rice farmers, 
that they will pay them $900 a bag per party. $9,000 a bag per party. That's what they told them. They said that they will hold this big rice conference and they will ensure that the industry is managed properly. When they left government, the rice industry was in complete tatters, as was every other productive sector in this country. They seized lands from the rice farmers. They raised the land rents and DNI drainage and irrigation charges at MMA to exorbitant levels, hundreds of percentage of increases. We have since bring them back, bring those rates back to what they were prior to 2015. They met David Granger, the president, met the rice farmers and said rice is private business. Government doesn't plant rice. Government doesn't cultivate rice. But they took the people rice, the millers rice, that the millers owe the farmers for, and gave it to Panama. 7.5 million. You know the, the farmer, the millers sold the rice to the rice board, never got paid. The, mill, the rice farmers never got paid from the millers either. Because the millers never got paid. Because the industry is run like that. It's run on a credit basis, on a trust basis. So they bankrupted several rice farmers and millers. And I just give you this one example to again remind you that these are the very people who are lecturing you and lecturing us about responsible government and about competent governance. Right now they're doing that in America. Norton is in Canada and use in America. That's what they're doing right now. Ask them why they didn't collect the money from Panama. Ask them why they have entered into a parking meter contract that is the worst in the world. Ask them why they enter into an oil and gas contract that is the worst in the world. All of those things they have saddled Guyana with. They have saddled the PVP government with. Every day in the court system, we have to pay judgments in relation to transactions conducted by them, <coughs> which they mock up. We have to pay a Jamaican company some nearly a million US dollars for the West Coast Road, which was completed under them. They never paid. They never paid the money. The company now is taking our government to court and we now have to find the money. And I can recite dozens of cases like that. I've been speaking about them over and over again. And the, the, what I find, and, what, and that's what I, I have to remind you of, because sometimes we have shallow memories. Because these people are convincing when they speak. So you would tend to forget that they were here just recently. And this is what they did. So our government had to get the Panamanian government to pay the money that was owed since 2016, 2017 by the coalition government. And as I said, the record is there. They never even tried to get the money for the millers and the farmers. It's like if they don't care. Well, it's not a, if they don't care, they, they didn't care. We had to go and engage lawyers and travel to Panama, hire people in Panama, go to arbitration. President had to get involved to get this money. It took us a long time. Look how many years he spent. These people are callous, cruel, and careless. They, don't, they simply don't care. Please ensure that you share the program so that all your friends and followers can join us on our 
on, on our discussions tonight. And as I said, the um, column section, the comment section is open for your input. The other, <clears throat> another important issue that I want to address is the contention by Mr. Norton, Aubrey Norton, leader of the opposition, that the president did not consult him in respect of the impending appointment of Mr. Clifton Hickins to the Office of Commissioner of Police. Mr. Norton, as a result, says that the engagement by the president is illegal, that he was not consulted in accordance with the Constitution, and that he, he does not support Hickin, and that he will challenge the any such appointment made in the courts. Let me say unequivocally and unambiguously that in his engagement with the leader of the opposition in relation to the appointment of Mr. Clifton Hickins, Hickin and five identified deputy assistant commissioners to be appointed deputy commissioners. His Excellency, the President, has scrupulously followed the letter and spirit of the relevant provisions of the Constitution. In consequence, there is nothing improper and nothing illegal and nothing unconstitutional that the president has done thus far in respect of these impending appointments. And I want to discuss that a little. Because as I said, I would like this program to be educational. So I want you to understand how the commissioner of police in Guyana is appointed and how deputy commissioners of police are appointed. So the Constitution of Guyana governs the appointment of the commissioner of police and the deputy commissioner of police, and deputy commissioners of police. The relevant articles in the Constitution, or the relevant article in the Constitution is Article 211. Any one of you can go and search for the Constitution of Guyana online and go straight to Article 211 of the Constitution. And you will see that it specifically deals with the appointment of a person to act, to perform the function, to act in the Office of Commissioner of Police, and also to be appointed to the Office of Commissioner of Police, that is substantive, as well as it also provides for the appointment of Deputy Commissioners of Police. The process for the appointment of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioners of Police is an identical one. So whether the person is going to be appointed to act as a commissioner of police or substantively commissioner of police or deputy commissioner of police, it is the same process outlined by Article 211 of the Constitution. The person to make the appointment is the president. There is no doubt about that. So it's a presidential power vested by the Constitution in His Excellency, the President. No one can dispute that. So it's a presidential power of appointment. The Constitution also tells you, so that's who is to appoint. The Constitution tells you next how the appointment is to be made. 
the constitution says that the president shall engage in meaningful consultation with the leader of the opposition and the police, the chairperson of the police service commission after the chairperson has consulted with the other members of the commission. So the who is the president and the how is that the president must make the appointment after meaningful consultation with the leader of the opposition and the chairman of the police service commission after that chairman has conducted consultation with the other members of the commission. Good. The next question is, what is meaningful consultation? The constitution defines again what meaningful consultation is. So if you go to 232 of the constitution, it defines what meaningful consultation is. It says that consultation or meaningful consultation means that the person or entity responsible for seeking the consultation, in this case, that is the president, shall identify the persons or entities to be consulted. So the persons or entities to be consulted here is the leader of the opposition and the chairperson of the police service commission. So the president must identify them and specify to them in writing the subject of the consultation and the intended date for the decision on the subject of the consultation. So you got to tell them what you're consulting them about and the date of the intended decision that you, in, that you wish to make based upon the consultation. Then must ensure, the president must ensure that each person or entity to be consulted is afforded a reasonable opportunity to express a considered opinion on the subject of the consultation. So the president must ensure that the two entities to be consulted is given a reasonable opportunity for them to express a considered opinion. And then thirdly, cause to be prepared, the president must cause to be prepared and archived a written record of the consultation and circulate the decision to each of the persons or entities consulted. Right? So that's read, I read straight from the constitution. So you know now how, a, who is to appoint the commissioner of police and who is to appoint a deputy commissioner of police and how they are to be appointed. I've just explained to you there. Is the president and how the president must exercise this power. You will note that the president must engage in meaningful consultation, not get the agreement of, because there are some appointments in the constitution which requires the president to secure from the leader of the opposition his agreement. As you heard, as I read just now, this is not one of those appointments. One of those appointments, for example, is the appointment of the Chancellor and the Chief Justice of the country. In, that, in those appointments, the leader of the opposition's agreement is required. Here, only meaningful consultation must be engaged in by the President. So that is clear. So let's go to what the President did now. You heard there nothing about oral engagement, writing. You heard about the president is required to write and keep an archive of the record. And they must be given an opportunity to write back to say that they have, they have given an opportunity to express their considered opinion. Nothing to do with a face-to-face -face meeting. Nothing to do with oral engagement. The president wrote to the leader of the opposition and the police, the chairman of the police service commission since September the 4th, 2024. 
wrote to Mr. Norton, he informed Mr. Norton that he proposes to appoint Clifton Hicken, acting commissioner of police, as commissioner of police. So he identified the persons who is to be uh, uh, consulted as Norton and the chairman of the police service commission. He specified to them why he writing them, what is the subject. The subject is the appointment of Hikin from acting to substantive. He, at, in the letter, he attached the CV of Mr. Hikin. And the letter further says that His Excellency intends to make the, a decision with respect to the said appointment and a date is specified. A date is specified. The letter also requests a response from Mr. Norton by the 18th of September, 2024. This letter was dated 4th of September, 2024. This letter satisfies all the requirements I've just laid out here. A similar letter was sent in relation to the deputy commissioners of police. Their names were listed, five of them, and their CVs were included, and the same date was specified, and Mr. Norton was invited to respond. Mr. Norton, and the same letter was sent to the chairman of the police service commission. Mr. Norton did not reply in relation to the deputy commissioners of police. We, re we received no letter in relation to the Deputy Commissioner of Police. On the 17th of September 2024, Mr. Norton wrote a two-page letter objecting to Mr. Hickin's appointment, and that he's entitled to do. And he gave a number of reasons for his objections. So he was given a reasonable opportunity to express a considered opinion on the subject. And that is what he did. He replied within the time afforded to him by the president, and he gave a reasonable and considered opinion for why he is dis disagreeing or not supporting the appointment. He wrote two full pages. And he cited a number of reasons. In response, the president wrote him back. And the president wrote him back on the 2nd of October, 2024. And the president letter is even longer. And the president answered all the questions, all the issues that he raised, paragraph by paragraph. And many of them, the president's response proved that the contentions of Mr. Norton were factually inaccurate. The president's response outlined that Mr. Hickin is the most senior member of the Guyana police force and acted for all the number of years. And the, it went on to answer each and every contention advanced by Mr. Norton. Two, uh, more than two full pages written by the president. The Police Service Commission has also responded to the president. So on what basis, and this is where we are now. This is where we are now. Mr. Norton is contending that the Constitution was breached, that he was not consulted. And I've just read to you what the Constitution says in relation to what is required for consultation or meaningful consultation. And I've just gone through what the President has done and how Norton has responded. Yet he contends that he was not consulted. He was not engaged. A complete and utter fabrication. 
and if Norton, if Mr. Norton believes that constant consultation or meaningful consultation requires a face-to-face -face meeting, well then he's hopelessly wrong because the Constitution does not expressly or impliedly requires such an engagement. So any actions or any action filed by Mr. Norton in this regard will be strenuously defended and will be dismissed by any impartial competent court. You are intelligent people. You have just heard me go through all the things. There must not be, there is no requirement for agreement, so the president doesn't have to agree with what Mr. Norton says, and Mr. Norton doesn't have to agree to Mr. what the president says. And Mr. Norton doesn't have to agree or support Mr. Hickey. That, that's the first thing. Two, there is no requirement for any face-to-face -face meeting. In fact, the Constitution contemplates a written dialogue. A written dialogue. Because it says that the President must prepare an archive and file all the exchange of documents. So I think that I have dealt adequately with the Commission of Police issue and I would have settled, hopefully, in your mind that nothing unlawful was done in relation thereto. You would recall that this is not the first time that Mr. Norton is, would be challenging Mr. Hickin's Mr. Hickin appointment, because when Mr. Hickin was appointed to act by the president, the situation was even worse. There was no opposition leader for the president to consult, and there was no police commissioner for the president to consult. So the president went ahead and made the appointment. Mr. Norton, when he became opposition leader, through Carol Joseph, sued the Attorney General, challenging the appointment of Mr. Hickin on the ground that there was no consultation with the leader of the opposition. And we pointed out to the court very clearly that there was no leader of the opposition and there was no police service commission in place. And the power resides with the president. If I have a power to do something, but I must do it conditionally, and the, the basis for the condition doesn't exist, I can't lose my power. I will have to exercise my power in the absence of the conditionalities, especially since it was not the president's fault that there was no opposition leader. They were fighting among themselves. And because there was no opposition leader, there could not have been a police service commission appointed because the, the president has to consult with the leader of the opposition to do so. And you have a police force that is responsible for national security in the country, for the maintenance of public order. As they were fighting, they expected the president to twiddle his thumb and leave the office of the police force vacant. Because you would recall that by that time, Mr. Nigel Hoppy, the then acting commissioner of police, proceeded on leave, on pre-retirement leave. And so they challenged. And of course they lost. And they were ordered to pay costs. But what was even more bizarre in that case is that they produced evidence to the court which established that the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Home Affairs had appointed Nigel Hoppy to act as Commissioner of Police. Do you hear what I'm saying? They produced evidence. Remember, they were in government. They appointed Nigel Hoppy two days before we were sworn in. And you know who appointed him? 
not the president, who would have been Mr. Granger at the time, as is required by the Constitution, the permanent secretary for the Ministry of Home Affairs made the appointment. When the Constitution says clearly that the president must make it, but must make it after meaningfully consulting with the leader of the opposition. There was a leader of the opposition. Bharat Jagde was the leader of the opposition at the time. Two days before we were sworn in. They disregarded Jagdeo, disregarded the Constitution, not even Granger appointed, but the PS of Home Affairs appointed. And these people are, and they have the audacity and the temerity to challenge us in court on the appointment of a commission of police. When they put their PS to appoint, they kick the Constitution aside. These are the things that I have to keep explaining to you so that you never see these people. You must always see them in the light that they should be seen. And I am not fabricating these things. Go, there is a judgment from the Chief Justice to this effect. And their own lawyer, Roysdale Ford, produced the letter. The Chief Justice and myself were stunned because we really thought that the man was properly appointed. We were not in government. And Roysdale Ford, their own lawyer, who is arguing that we didn't comply with the Constitution, that the President didn't consult with the leader of the opposition, produced a letter to show how they appointed Hoppy in the office. Thankfully, Hoppy had demitted office by then. So these people can't be trusted with anything. They don't have any, any integrity. They have no track record of doing anything correctly. But they are the first to run to court. They are the first to run to court. So, I think I've exhausted that issue of the Commission of Police. And I, I want to move on. So, the Alliance for Change, as I said, led by Nigel Hughes and a delegation of the AFC, are in New York and various parts of the U.S. meeting different people. I am told that they met the Secretary of State and they are discussing a number of issues, including the rule of law. Well, for example, I hope, well, you know, they would never tell the rule of law, they, ne they will never tell the head of the Secretary of State how they appointed Hoppy to office, for example. How they violated the Constitution. Because, you see, they want to reinvent themselves. They want to distance themselves. In particular, Nigel Hughes wants to distance himself from APNU. But it was APNU and AFC that was in the government. They will not tell... They, imagine they're talking about the rule of law. They will not tell this Secretary of State, how they trampled upon the Constitution to appoint the chairman of GCOM. They will not tell the chief, the, the, the State Department, how Granger revoked the Rice Farmers lease without a hearing. And all these things were confirmed by the court, with rulings from the court. How they directed political directions to the Public Service Commission and the Police Service Commission. I have court orders to that effect. I took all these matters to court because I don't want ever for it to be said that these things didn't happen. The difference between them and I is that when I went to court, I used to win. They are going to court, but they're not winning. They will not tell the Secretary of State how Nigel Hughes 
work out mathematically that 33 is not a majority of 65 so that they don't have to they don't have to respect the no confidence motion and hold the election they would not tell the secretary of state that you have to tell the secretary of state that those of you who live in the u.s and tell the state department these are the same bandits who did that they will not tell the State Department, the role that they played in rigging the 2020 elections. Spending five months in their attempts to rig the 2020 election. They're not going to tell the Americans that. You saw them. It's Kati Hughes and Ramjatan who on the television spoke about Russians coming here to rig the elections. They were very much there every day on the Facebook, defending the lawlessness that Lowenfield was doing and Myers were doing. They would not tell, Nigel News would not say that he's leading the team of lawyers who are representing these persons who get charged with rigging the elections. They would not say those things. They're going to speak they are as though they are so pious and pure. But, but let us see what they're asking for. They want, uh, let me see, I have it here. They released you this press statement. A new registration process ahead of Guyana's national elections. They are misrepresenting what the registration process is. We have a continuous registration process that is ongoing all year, all year round. It will only stop at election to produce a new list. They are calling for a new list. A new list will be produced for the 2020, 2025 elections based upon a continuous registration system. So what new list is calling for? Every election gets a new list one that is produced by GCOM on a continuous registration basis. We have put over 100 amendments in the law to ensure that that list is kept clean, that dead people are removed from it, that those who should not be on the list should not be on the list. We have court rulings that tell us who must be on that list. They want us the very people that they're speaking to, the diaspora, that they're speaking to in Brooklyn and in Queens and wherever they're speaking, they want to take those very people name off the list. They want to take those very people name off the list. They wouldn't tell the people them that either. That is the duplicity. That is the double standard. They want the people's money and they want the people's support. But they're not telling the people that they're calling for the removal of those people's names. And they try to remove them. We went to court and the Chief Justice says you can't remove them. Whether they live in Guyana, or whether they live in Canada, whether they live wherever they wish. Once they're Guyanese and they're qualified to vote, and they're registered, they must vote. And that's the law in most countries. People don't disenfranchise their citizens. You can live wherever you want. Once you desire to vote in your country, you have that right. You have that right. To take away that right from someone is a serious thing. And that's why the constitution of our country protects that right. So those people who they are asking for money in America, the Guyanese, they will not tell those people that they are trying to take their names off the list here. We have put in the law how the list must be rinsed of dead people and those who should not be on the list. And those people who should not be on the list are specified in the category of cases, are specified in the Constitution. The truth of the matter is that they cannot win no election. So they want to interfere with everything 
to give them opportunities along the way, to give them a platform to run around the place after the elections to see that the elections was rigged. All the deficiencies that they are complaining about were there in 2015 and 2011. And in those two elections, the list was 10 times worse than it is. And it will be in 2025. They won a majority in 2011. Everything was perfect. They won a majority. They won the government in 2015. Everything was perfect. They will not tell the State Department that is the same list and the same system were in place. In fact, we now will have the, the cleanest possible list going forward for the 2025 elections. But that's all that they do. They lie, they mislead, and that's what con people do. Con people do that. They're conning people all over the place. Conning people all over the place. You think if they win any election, they give in cash transfer? That is the easiest and most, is the easiest and possibly the most attractive thing to say to anybody. If I win the election, I get ten million dollars. Any clown can say that. Any clown can say that. Isn't that what they told the rice farmers? We'll give you nine thousand dollars a bag for party. Isn't that what they told the sugar workers? We're going to increase your salary by I don't know how much. What did they do? They shut down all the estate and chase all of home. They are con artists. And that's what they're doing all over the place. Conning people into telling them lies. With the hope. What con people do when they're trying to con you? They hope that you give them some money. They hope that you give them your jewelry. They hope that you give them something. They said a con artist collecting money and they're hopefully getting, trying to get your votes. A con man will tell you anything you want to hear because he wants what you have. This is not politics. This is con artistry. And these fellows here are very qualified. They're very slick. You know, con artists are very slick people. They always talk fancy. You will listen to the accent and you will listen to the air of sophistication and you will look at the corsage in the pocket and you will look at a nice tie and look at the tie pin and you look at an expensive suit. That's how a con man is attired. And he has the, the language, the suave, the sophistication, the charm, the charisma. And once he gets what he wants, he's done with you. That is what you see in there. That is what is going on there. Check their track record. They're not new people. Check all of them. In the APNU, AFC. Patterson has about 15 charges. You know about the gold band, the bed sheet, the bed spread, and all kind of things. The same set of people can't use in court. Just last month, admitted on the oath that as a minister, her ministry gave her own company contracts. And I shall use the litany of what I can say is too much. It's too much. I can't, I gotta do a whole program about that. So don't be carried away with these people and their antics and their smooth talking and their promises. It's all con. Remember, and, and you have a track record to look at. My job is to remind you and to educate you so that you don't become victim. You, you, are not, you, you don't become gullible and absorb these things and get carried away with them. My job is to bring reality into your consciousness. And I hope I am doing so with facts. Because I want you also to be educated and to have the law and the facts at your disposal. So that you can take positions and defend the positions. And that's why I always have my books and I give you the right sections of the constitution or the law. 
and, and I ask you to read it yourselves so that you yourself can convince people and you can begin to unmask these bandits that are going around in suits. Next week, I will be in Geneva, Switzerland, representing the government of Guyana at the 149th Interparliamentary Union Conference. So we will not have this program, unfortunately. The theme of that conference is democracy everywhere. That's the theme of the conference. I'll be addressing that conference, and it's our hope to get a team from the IPU to observe our elections. Because the election teams are still around. They are still here. And trust me, they will try to steal the elections. We have to get as many observers as we possibly can. So this is a body of 180 odd parliaments across the globe, the largest association of parliaments in the world. So it's a very powerful grouping and we hope to get them to come to observe the elections. At least we will invite them to come. So my operator is signaling to me that we have come to program time. I want to thank you very much for spending the past hour with me. I think that we have covered a lot of important issues and I'll see you uh, not next week, the following week. Praise God, please stay safe and stay healthy. Enjoy the rest of the evening and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you very much and it was a pleasure to be with you over the past hour. Thank you. <laughs>